Thank you for reading. Nice to see you all this evening. Please keep your Bibles open to that passage in Ephesians chapter 2 and 3. That's what we're going to be focusing on tonight as we continue our series on a transformed community. <clears throat> the question I want to be addressing tonight is what brings us together as a church? That is, what is it that, that actually is the purpose for which we're coming together? What is it that we're gathering around? What's our, and I suspect As we were to answer that question about what brings us together, we would have a sophisticated answer. Most of us would say, well, Jesus, of course. I I suppose that's what you would say. But I wonder if we drilled down and we thought about it, even just our expectations for uh, what we're experiencing and participating in, would we actually find that it's true of our life together? The various ministries that we're involved in, the messages that we're hearing, the prayers that we're praying, the music that we're singing, whatever it may be, is it all about Jesus? Now, I raise this question without any real critique, actually, of our church. I'm I'm bringing this message without um, any harsh word for any one of us. I actually rejoice in what I hear and see among us here. I think most of us really want Jesus at the center. But the way that I want to address the question is perhaps the surprising ways where our focus can be moved, or where we might miss it. Here's what I mean. Um, I visited a church many years ago, and I don't want you to try to guess which one, because it was in Sydney. And I think it reflected many of the churches around, and probably reflected a lot of the so-called wisdom that came from probably America, uh, and, and was trying to help churches grow. What, what it was is that congregations began to be organized by demographics. And so, the way that it worked at this church was this. You start in creche, you get dropped off in the creche. Okay? You never come in the building, you just go to the creche. Then you get graduated into the kids' ministry. Then you move to the junior high ministry. Then you move to the high school ministry. Then you go to the evening church, which on their website said, quote, this is a quote, is a place for tertiary students, young workers, and young marrieds without children, comma, but all are welcome. Then, when you have children, you go to a church plant that's for families. Then when your kids reach the age of the youth ministry, you move to the middle-aged adult contemporary service, where you stay until you're an empty nester, and for a little while while you're an empty nester, Then once you retire, or you're so old that you get up really early and need a mid-morning nap, you then move to the oldies service, the traditional service, early in the morning, and then you die. Birth to death, right? Birth to death. We have an age and a stage ministry for you to see you through each age and stage. The trouble with this, of course, is that you're never interacting with people more than five or ten years, your junior or your senior. It's a very, very targeted approach to church. Now, I love that many of you are here actually because you want something different than that, and I celebrate that with you. I celebrate that with you. There's a lot of varieties, though, that go around, and so again, I'm not talking to any one of you in particular, but there's a lot of varieties of this kind of thinking that are around, how we divide the people of God. Historically, we've done this for really good reasons, I think. That is, that we want to reach people for Christ. We really want people to know Jesus, and we think about things sociologically, that is, in sociology, there's, there's something about how we like to relate to people. Like attracts like. And so we create services where people who are like that kind of service will be drawn in. I've heard this from, you know, kind of cool kids church. I've heard it to, um, you know, an Italian church. Not in Italian, just for Italians. Um, I've heard it for uh, people that like Hawaiian-themed Things. So you could come in a Hawaiian shirt with ukulele and um, island vibes, kind of softer lighting. I, I kid you not, actually, there was a church that had that. I walked past that service and went to the um, punk rock service. That was the one I went to, yeah. What's wrong with this picture? The difficulty is I, I, I love the motivation that drives it. We want people to know Jesus. But underneath all that, underneath it, is this problem. We begin to think that church is about me. 
It's about me going somewhere where I'm going to find people just like me, where I'm going to experience and maybe become a better version of me. And if I haven't offended you yet, this is probably my most offensive message in the series, by the way, and I don't mean it deliberately again to any one of you, but this structuring of our communities, I believe, actually undermines the gospel. As well-intentioned as it is and as, as deliberate as it may be, I actually think that it cuts our legs out from underneath us because while we might talk about Jesus over and over and over again about the center of our gathering, what we're actually communicating to people is that it's all about you and finding exactly what you like, what's going to make you feel comfortable And all we do in that moment, then, is communicate that Christian community is just like the world. It's about cultural affinity. It's a community where you can find what you like, be around people that are just like you, a place where we'll make you feel comfortable. But all these messages are actually not the gospel. That's the trouble. In fact, Christian community is radically different It's a radically different form of community because Jesus is at the center. And in order for us to appreciate this, we're going to have to look again at how Christ unites us as a people, and we're going to see why the gospel is so shockingly countercultural. What I want us to do tonight as we look down at Ephesians chapter 2 and chapter 3 is see God's purpose for the church. And I hope you'll be surprised and enjoy it. What we need to know is that as the baseline... All that we get to enjoy in church is in Christ. God's purposes for the world, and more specifically, for His people, are all grounded in Jesus. And so the first thing that I want us to notice tonight in our passage is that previously we were excluded, but now in Christ we're included, we belong. Previously we were excluded, but now in Christ we are included, we belong. The Apostle Paul writes about our problem in verse 11 of chapter 2. He says this, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Our problem is, was that we used to be regarded in the flesh, literally. Circumcision was that physical marker that separated the Gentiles and the Jews, the sign for men of Israel to mark them out as different, part of God's covenant people. But Paul makes the point this, that that it's actually a fleshly way of relating, literally a fleshly way of relating to people. And really what he's trying to help us see is that It was something done to the body, done by human hands. It's a mere superficial sign. It's something that was obviously intended to signify something deeper, but had now just become a way of separating the Israelite community from others. And there were other signs that actually followed suit for both men and women, making them distinctive from the others around them. Now, we have a lot of Jewish neighbors in this part of Sydney. If you drive around on a Friday night up to Bellevue Hill or Rose Bay or Dover Heights, you can physically see people walking because it's Sabbath. They're not driving, they're walking deliberately, and they're in their kit. You can tell people that are Jewish physically by looking at them. There are fleshly ways we can identify them. But Paul's point here about these signs is that these things that led to a fleshly sort of a regard for people were really intended to include or exclude a community because of things that they did to belong. These are ways of actually excluding people from a community. And the trouble was that what they were meant to symbolize was a heart devoted to God. It was supposed to be a physical marker of a spiritual reality. As we read in Isaiah earlier, God desired people who would genuinely follow Him. Holiness is a kind of exclusivity. But cultural snobbery is different. I don't know if you've ever been excluded from a group. I suspect you have. Um, I'm I'm learning all about exclusion again um, right now, raising kids, because I'm, I'm hearing from them all about, you know, 
playground politics, right? Schoolyard politics and schoolyard drama. I do not remember that much drama growing up, but there's a lot of drama around. And so much of it's about who's included and who's excluded. For me personally, I think about golf. Um, this is not going to be a sports illustration. But golf works like this. The best courses in golf are typically private. They're exclusive. And as a golfer, um, that I, I love to play, and I would love to play the best courses, but while I can drive past them, while I can Google them and see pictures of them, maybe even while I can go to a tournament and walk around and watch people play them, I'm not allowed on the courses because I'm excluded from them. I'm not a member. They're private. And it's in this way that I think exclusivity becomes so desirable when you can't have something when it's off limits, you kind of want to be on the inside. That's why we like exclusive things. You become more desperate to be included. But once you are included, if you're lucky enough to be included, you now want to preserve and protect that exclusivity because it's the very thing that makes it so special. But here's the key difference that I think. Some exclusivity, some exclusivity serves the purpose of holiness. It's keeping something pure and unstained and sacred even. But there's another kind of exclusivity that's less concerned with integrity and more concerned with status. What's protected is the status of the members of society. Amy and I lived in Alabama for a little while. If you don't know what Alabama is, I, should, I suspect you do because you've seen Sweet Home Alabama, but you, you imagine the, um, the South in America, right? And um, there was this ridge line in the city in Alabama, in Birmingham where I lived, and there was a club that sat right on top of the ridge looking down on everybody else. It was called The Club. And anytime you ask people about it, it was a private social club, Anytime you ask people about it, they always italicized the in their words. There was never the club. It was always the club. And I'd say, oh, sorry, what, member, what club are you a member at? Oh, I'm a member at the club. Oh, okay. Um, I visited that club once. I was fortunate enough uh, as a photographer. And I went in there and I realized this place is not so special. It's pretty dated, actually. Um, it had a nice view, but it's pretty dated. What it protected was not a special thing. It was a status. It was all about just saying, I belong to the club. And I suspect for Israel, this is what had happened. Rather than guarding something special like holiness, what they were protecting was being the people. But herein lies the offense. God is not a tribal deity. You know that, right? It's not just one God amongst many. It's not one God of one particular part of the world. Our God is the God of all nations, of all peoples. And He would not be known by Israel alone. He would be regarded and revered and worshipped by all peoples of the world. And so, these people have guarded the sacred things and turned them into signs of status. Those who weren't included, others from any nation apart from Israel, were literally cut off from the benefits of God's people. Did you hear what Paul said in verse 12? He said this, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. What did this mean practically? Well, he tells us at the end of verse 12, they were without hope because they were without God in the world. That's devastating. It, it's hard to imagine something so desperate. I've tried to think about it this week, and this is the only thing. I'm not great with illustrations, but the only illustration I could think of is imagining being out in a desert, and you're in just like this really like sand dune kind of desert. And in the middle of it, there's a glass room. And the glass room is air-conditioned perfectly. And inside, there's banquet tables of just, I mean, lavish food, cool water to drink. And outside is just this arid, 
dry desert. No food, no water for miles. The trouble is that inside the people who are there, they are more concerned with taking selfies being inside the glass cube with all their food and drink than actually the benefits of what they have there. It's about status more than about their, their life. And outside, there are people piled around, desperate to get in, but excluded from it, watching on, could not care less about status. They're starving, desperate. That's a picture. That's a picture of the disparity that captures a little bit of what Paul speaks about. But the analogy breaks down because it's not just comfort that we're talking about inside the cube. It's eternal life. It's knowing the purpose for which you were made. It's delighting in the very God who gave you life and breath and being. So how wonderful, how wonderful is it then when Paul writes in verse 13, but now, but now, you used to be excluded, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood. Imagine that cube being opened up and you get to run in from the desert and just, oh, I get to escape the heat. I get to eat. I get to drink. I get to live. How wonderful. What relief you would feel. That's the relief of the gospel for us. Now I get to know the God who I was previously cut off from. Now I've been brought near to him by the blood of Christ. Again in verse 19, You're no longer strangers and aliens. You're now fellow citizens with the saints. Now you're included. Now you enjoy the full privileges of membership. Now you can delight in all the promises of God that have been realized in Christ Jesus because now you truly belong. Notice again, just as we've seen in the previous weeks, that our membership here in God's community, is never based on us. It's always based on another. It's not like you've been on the waiting list for the SCG for 12 or 15 years or whatever it is to get into the members. It's not like that. It's not like your turn's finally come up. It's not like you've paid your dues finally to join the membership fees. It's not like you've reached a high enough status in society to finally be noticed and people say, hey, we'd we'd like you in our club. You're now a full member in the people of God because of Jesus. That's the sweetest thought. He gave his blood to bring you near to God. The entrance fee was his life, and now your membership as part of the people is and always will be in Christ. Did you see what he said in verse 12? You used to be separated You used to be excluded, not because you were born of the wrong people, because you were separated from Christ. Nobody belongs because of their heritage. Nobody belongs because of some birthright. We're included in Christ by the grace of God. We're included in Christ by faith. We trust that God has indeed acted to bring us near. To make us one of his people. And so when you think about coming to church, when you think about coming to this community, this is really important for us because what brings us together? It's Christ. And if that's the case, if we belong in him, which is what the passage tells us, then whenever we make church about demographics, about certain kinds of things that make our our church what it is, We risk making it about superficial things rather than about Jesus himself. Fleshly things. If church is only for cool people, or if it's only for family, or if it's only for old people, or if it's only for single people, or if it's only for Hawaiian shirt-wearing people, then we've defined it by something other than Jesus himself. Jesus is the one that brings us together as his people. This gets us to our second thing. 
The first thing is that we belong. We once were excluded, now we're included. We belong. The second thing is this. Previously, there were hostilities, real hostilities. But in Christ, there's peace. We're reconciled. So many people think that religion is the cause of conflict in the world, and I suspect that there's some real validity to this point. If you think about it, politics are often about power, and religion is so easily weaponized as a source of power over another group. I don't know how many of you have been to Malaysia. Some of you might have come from Malaysia. Uh, We certainly have Malaysian families in the morning. Uh, Malaysia's history in the last hundred years has been one of decolonization. It's moved away from the British Empire to being its own nation. And, and in that time, what's happened is the Islamic faith has become the official religion, which means that if you're Christian or you're Buddhist or you're Hindu, three significant minority groups in Malaysia, you are actually marginalized. You're kept out of some of the benefits of society because you are not of Islamic faith. In Paul's time, exclusivity of the Israelites created tensions with the nations around them. Deep hostility. And we can see how much of this hostility has persisted today if you think about Israel and Hamas, or Israel and Hezbollah. They're essentially religious conflicts that have been politicized. It's much more than land and governance that's driving the hatred and the violence. We need to appreciate that this sort of disdain for the life and culture of others is what we used to know. Previously, we would have been cut off. Previously, there was deep hostility. And it's not just hostility between us and each other, it's actually hostility between us and God. That's the deepest hostility that existed. And what's changed in the the battleground, if you will, the landscape, is not that we've somehow surrendered or the Israelites did, but actually somebody came in and intervened to bring peace. Jesus Christ himself came to break down the dividing wall of hostility, the wall that separated us culturally, the wall that separated us from God. Jesus came to break that down and demolish it. Verse 14 tells us that he himself is our peace. What did he do to achieve that peace? He died to bring the Mosaic law to its end, its rightful end. The law had in many ways led to a culture that turned against the nations around Israel. And the Israelites had developed a culture of hostility to those around them. And here Paul wants believers to know that the law had reached its end in Christ. No longer were there dividing walls between people groups. No longer were there dividing walls between us and God. Jesus came to bring forth a new humanity. Jesus doesn't just bring peace by making Gentiles into Jews. He doesn't do it by making Jews into Gentiles. He actually takes something, not this, not this, and he kind of comes in and says, I'm actually bringing a new humanity. You're welcome into the new humanity, the new man, me. Stand in me. Stand in Christ. So now there's genuine peace. Peace that we're no longer clinging to our former ways. Peace that we're no longer engaging one another in the same rules. Now we're together something new in Christ. Reconciliation. More than just coexistence, actually something new emerging. Our old ways nullified. It has a deeper consequence, as I've been saying. We don't just have peace between human parties, between Jews and Gentiles. We do, but we have been reconciled to God, Paul tells us. He says in verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. True peace. True peace is not about us engaging one another and saying everything's cool. True peace comes at a much deeper level. 
It has to come to something much more fundamental to who we are and how we exist. It has to come with our Creator, God. And Jesus brings us that kind of peace through justice. God held our sin to account in Christ. He's literally killed the hostility between us and God in His death. And so we have deep and meaningful peace with God. In fact, now we share the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, in whom we enjoy access to God our Father. So when we gather, we have a peace that doesn't come from who we are or what we bring the community. I'm not against you. You're not against me. There's no rivalry or competition. Together, we enjoy the peace that's come to us from another. Peace from Jesus. In Christ, true reconciliation. In fact, we're now one body, Christ's body, the church. And so anytime we make our gathering about ourselves or any other issue, we jeopardize the basis of our peace. Let me give you one example of how I think this happens. We can make the gathering about our preferences very easily. Music is one of those classic culture wars in church. Now, um, you get the cool music in the evening because you come to the cool music service, right? That's the idea. Um, classically, you have kind of different ways that people engage music in church. And instead of addressing these issues, historically, a lot of times people have just set up different services with different vibes. Like I said, you know, you have kind of adult contemporary music and you have kind of cool alternative music or you might have pipe organ music or whatever it may be. And the ways we've dealt with difference of preferences just divide. But music's purpose in the church is not to serve our preferences. Nor is it to showcase a style or abilities or to be culturally relevant. That we have a preference or that we have some great abilities or that we even like cultural expressions are not the problem. But it's not what music is supposed to be focused on. Our music is an expression of the peace that we enjoy with God and one another. We sing together in praise, worshiping and delighting in loving and our loving and gracious God. And so it can be to the accompaniment of the pipe organ, as we had a few weeks ago. Thank you, Riley. Or it can be to the tune of an electric guitar. Thank you tonight, Jared. The instrument is not the focus. Our common life in Christ is what's on display. And as we sing in harmonious praise, we're making known that fact that we are together in Jesus. And this gets us to our third thing. The first thing was that we belong. The second thing is that we have real peace. We've been reconciled. And the third thing is this, that previously we were separated and in Christ now, we are incorporated. Previously we were separated, but now in Christ we're incorporated. We've been united. What I mean by this is that Israel previously had a way of dealing with the nations around them. They would, in theory, allow them to come and worship, but they were always allowed to worship at a distance. In the temple, there was a separate court created for the Gentiles, the other nations that weren't Israelites. There was a, a court for the Gentiles, a court for the women, a court for the men, a court for the priests, right? So you could have different layers of intimacy with God in one sense. Now apartheid is a way of coexisting with difference. It gives separate places to people based on inherent characteristics. You can think about South Africa or you could think about the American South where rules of segregation were enforced in the name of peace. But when Jesus made a way for people to come from all nations unto God, to come near, it wasn't based on a new system of segregation. Instead, Jesus brings full incorporation to his people. It's really difficult to understand how shocking that is. We are all one in him. We all have equal access to God in Him. We're a united body. 
In fact, the image that Paul uses for us in this passage is one of a temple being built together on a common foundation, a building foundation. There's a cornerstone that everything gets aligned to, and it's Jesus. And we, like bricks, are being put together, aligned to Christ, built up into this beautiful structure, a temple for God to dwell in. I love that. Together, no longer separate for Gentiles or men or women or priests. All of us together, a place where God dwells. And what's really lovely is that we often think about the Spirit dwelling in me or in you. And that's, that's important and significant. But actually, so much of the language around the Spirit dwelling in us, God dwelling with us, is corporate. Together, God's Spirit is among us. So here together, we are being built into an elaborate, gorgeous, diverse structure, God himself dwelling in us. We've seen three rich truths tonight, all different facets really of the same reality. God's people are now comprised of all peoples. All of us have equal access to the same God. In fact, all of us now have been reconciled to God and united to one another. And all of this is in Christ. And this gets to a final thing that Paul explores in chapter 3, which we're not going to look at in detail. But it's this. Paul declares that there is a great mystery. And what he's been speaking of is actually a great mystery. And Paul's whole ministry was dedicated to proclaiming this mystery. He says in verse 5, in fact, look down at it. It wasn't made known previously to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What is this mystery? He says in verse 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles, the nations, are fellow heirs members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That is such a lovely thought. Now what's more is that Paul says that his whole life and ministry is dedicated to that mystery. That's what his ministry is about. Why though? Why is that so significant? Here it is. You ready? The purpose of the church is told to us. The whole purpose for which we are brought together is this, verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's the purpose of the church. We are brought together, we come together and are being transformed now into the likeness of Christ as a community to put on display to realms unseen, powers unseen, how great God's wisdom is. I imagine this. I think there's, there are angelic powers in heaven looking down and kind of like, what an odd bunch. Like, them? They're God's people now? Wow. But not like, wow, like, I can't believe, like, that you would choose them. Probably that too, but you can actually bring them together as your people, one people from all nations. How wise, God. How wise. The Thanksgiving we said earlier, that phrase around the throne of God from Revelation chapter 4 and 5 is declaration of praise that the Lamb has drawn nations together as one people for God. Think about this earth. Think about the conflict that exists. Think about the efforts at peace through United Nations or something like that. It's not really achieved. Friends spy on friends. Tensions continue to mount. 
We start turning around and saying, oh no, we'll go America first again. We won't think about the other world. Or we'll have other ways that people will suddenly just revert back to old ways of thinking about them first over others. Where else in the world do we have a genuine community, nations united? The best thing is, it's not about you. It's about Christ. That's how it comes together. Praise God for His wisdom. In fact, verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that He has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It has always been God's plan to do this, to bring all things together in Christ. So, for too long now, so many churches have mimicked the ways of the world, making compatibility the focus of church rather than genuine gospel communion. I just want to say this. I really understand why it's been done. I've done it before. But every time we make a a church a place where in all of our efforts to give people a place to belong, Anytime we make it about some characteristic, some demographic, it excludes people rather than includes people in the people of God. The only thing we want to protect is that we are holy people. We are holy in Christ. We're not protecting our status. And so... The only viable barrier that I can imagine being given to churches is one of language. If we cannot understand one another, and if we cannot understand the Word of God together, then we may need to meet in a different group so that we can understand and have intelligible ministry. Because actually at the heart of how we are built up as God's people is the Word. It has to be intelligible. And in fact, next week we're going to be looking at how the Word is the center of our life together. We gather together to partake in gospel truth. And so what brings us together as a church? Well, far be it from us to name in theory or operate in practice that anything is our focus apart from Christ. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And we welcome together a whole bunch of randoms share the deepest and most meaningful relationship, not because of affinity, but because of Christ. I didn't do this this morning, but I just want to give you one anecdote. The best Bible study group I ever knew was actually a subset of our wider church. We had an 18-year-old gap year student. We had a couple of uni students. We had a young tradie, we had some working professionals, we had a couple getting engaged, we had a married couple, no children, we had our family with children, we had a a single woman in her 50s, we had a married woman in her 60s, and we had a gentleman with special needs in his 60s. It was like the most random bunch you could ever imagine. There was very little common between us other than that we were kind of regionally together. And it was super awkward. Let's be honest. It can be awkward. But can I tell you over time, do you know what happened? We loved each other. We loved each other like a family. We loved each other deeply, not because we were in sync and like totally into the same music or even enjoying the same foods or whatever else. We had such different backgrounds, such different professions, such different interests, but we were together in Christ, and those people were closer than so many other social groups in the world because it was about Jesus. And actually, as we learned to be together, do you know what happened to us? We were transformed. We were taught more of the love of Christ, shown it, learning to give it and receive it and just be together as God's people. Boy, it was rich. And you know what? That was a subset of what we get to enjoy every week at church. Praise God for the grace that he's given to us in Jesus. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, what a gift it is to be called your people. Lord, we, we, we do not know, we do not feel how significant it would have been to have been excluded previously. And therefore, Lord, we don't even appreciate fully how sweet it is to be included. To have real belonging. And Lord, we, we haven't experienced the fierce hostilities perhaps with others. And therefore, Lord, we also haven't really appreciated how fierce the hostility was with you because of our sin. But how wonderful, Lord, that we really have been reconciled. And Lord, we don't know what it's like to participate in ways that are segregated. We don't know um, just how off-putting that can be to be feeling lesser or continuing to feel outside. But Lord, full incorporation of us now in Jesus is a sweet thought. And so, Lord, as we think about our belonging and the peace that we know and our incorporation into the body, we pray, Lord, that we would treasure Jesus all the more because he's the focus of our gatherings. And pray, Lord, that we would recognize the grace that's brought us together and that because of that grace, we would love one another even better, not because of cultural similarities or just simple affinities, as sweet as these things can be and as natural as it makes us to relate, but actually we can relate across any barrier, really, because of grace. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. May our church continue to be built around him. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing now. So please stand and join us as we um, sing praises to our Lord and God. And the first song we'll be singing together is All Creatures.